everyone. Welcome to the episode. Today with me is Jamers. Welcome to the podcast. It's fine, yeah. Fine with me. <laughs> so to start things off, before going to Stunfest, I was curious, what aspects of the event were you most excited about? Uh, I was just most excited to like see all the see all the stuff there, see all the caps, like all this. There was also like all the all those new things, like special things, like the, the XE Akira stuff, and M2 stuff, and all sorts of new, all sorts of uh, silly things. Like also that uh, the Pink Sweets thing <laughs> that was pretty silly. Oh yeah, mm. I heard about that. It's like a rare version of Pink Sweets, right? Yeah, it's like some sort of ROM hack that changes a bunch of stuff in the game. Was that a ROM hack by Cave themselves, or did somebody separately go in there and ROM hack it? It was someone else's. <laughs> oh, okay. There's no, no way Cave would to make that. <laughs> I wasn't sure. So, was this your first Stunfest? Uh, no, it was like my third, I think. I think the oh, last okay. Time I, I think the first time was 2005, I want to say. 2015, I want to say. So, when you got to Stunfest this year, was there any changes that stood out to you compared to previous years? Uh, I think compared to like last last years, there was a bit less stuff mm -hmm. in general. Like there was a lot more empty space than uh, last times. I think. Oh, was the venue a larger venue this year, or is it just less stuff in the venue? It, it was the same, some same place as the previous times. It was just like less random stuff everywhere. <laughs> I like the bleachers and stuff were all filled with with random stuff like previous years. Like all sorts of Neo Geo stuff, like tiny, tiny TVs on the on the bleachers with. <laughs> with games. Oh, nice! It was like really packed, but yeah, I just say there was a bit less of that. So, as far as the shmup players go, where were you guys in the venue? We were like in the entrance to the left, and then uh, that little hall there was pretty packed with with cabs and stuff. Oh, nice! It was close to the entrance, yeah, at least. Were you guys kind of in the thick of things, or you're in your own corner? So to say, uh, it was yeah, kind of like our own corner, to be honest. Oh, okay. Like, uh, like the year before, um, all the caps were placed like directly at the main stage, so that was a bit different. Oh yeah. Which did you prefer between the two setups? It's hard to say. Like the main stage was kind of neat because you could also like follow the the main uh, the main event, see what's happening on the stage and stuff. But there was like a lot more, a lot more busy there, more people. Yeah, it was a lot harder to actually like play the games. I can so see that. All the time. That's so occupied all the time, yeah. Uh -huh. But this year, it was, it was pretty well visited as well, like the Schmop Corner. I think that was definitely a success. That's great. So was there a lot of crossover from people who weren't directly there for Schmups? Yeah, there was all sorts of people that were playing the games. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Were any of the big-name fighting game players interested in the games, or were they kind of just concerned with winning? <laughs> I don't think I saw any of those uh, in the shmup corner. <laughs> that would be fascinating if one of those big name fighting game players, I don't know, came over and was really into them or something. Yeah, like and on the main stage, the, the main stage was like divided in half between like the, the fighting game stuff and like the other stuff. I think like everyone mostly long like, hang out in the fighting game stuff for uh, fighting game uh, players, I think. I see. So what day did you arrive to Stunfest? Thursday at like. 3 a.m. and uh, p.m. I mean, not a.m. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit early. Yeah, was it a big time change for you, or was it not too bad? No, it's not too bad. It's okay. it's pretty where I live. It's not like really that far away. Uh, Rennes. Rennes was like six or seven hour train ride. Oh, okay. So you took the train, huh? Yeah, that's really cool. That's kind of funny because in the U.S. we don't. Not that I'm aware of, except maybe in San Francisco. People don't use trains to get <laughs> from place to place very often. So it's kind of cool to hear, you know, in Europe, that's pretty common. America is like a really big country. So I can imagine that, yeah, it takes a lot longer to get somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Like compared to where I live, uh, like the Netherlands is like a super tiny country. You can, mm -hmm. go from, can go from like the other end to the other end in like three hours. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah, even my state probably takes seven or eight hours to cross, like mm. from one end to the other. <laughs> I know that's crazy. Yeah. So when you got there on Thursday, what were your kind of the first thing you did when you got to Sunfest? Thursday it wasn't open yet, so uh, I just met up with the uh, with the with the uh, the other people there and just hang out, get to grab a drink and stuff. Right. Mm. Did you go to any arcades in Paris or anything like that? I don't think there are any arcades there. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. We didn't go to uh, anything like that anyway. We mostly stayed at the venue and uh, just went out for for uh, 
cook for dinner, do other random places there. I could see that. So on Fridays when the venue opened, so on Friday, what was the first thing you did? Breakfast, we grabbed some dinner, of course, some breakfast, and then we went uh, straight to the, the line. Mm-hmm. We were pretty early there, but the line was still pretty big. So, oh, really? Uh, mm, yeah, we got out like like two hours before before it opened, and there was already a line. Holy crap. <laughs> How many people were there, would you say, overall at the event? Was it massive? It was pretty big, yeah. We stood in line for like a couple of hours or something. And we were like one of the first, so we were like in the front. But if you looked back behind you, there was like a super long line that like went all around the plaza and down the street. Wow. There were a lot of people there, yeah, for sure. And so on Friday, did they have some of those special cabinets already set up and ready to go, like the XR Arcadia and everything? Yeah, everything was there, yeah. Straight from the get-go. When I talked with Plasmo and Eaglet last week, they said they spent the whole time, I guess they were part of the event staff, so they spent almost all the time running the event and doing all that. Yeah, I can imagine that, yeah. Were you there as, a, as only a guest? Did you have any kind of responsibilities as far as coordinating things or organizing things? No, nah, I was just a guest this year, so uh, I, I, I could take it easy. <laughs> I can imagine that was probably the like, more comfortable experience, just being a guest rather than being someone behind the scenes. It is, yeah. Because it's still like kind of like work if you uh, like have responsibilities there. Uh-huh, yeah. A lot of time is spent like doing other stuff that isn't like enjoying the event itself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember I ran a local tournament one time, and yeah, it was like work. I got to play only a little bit, and the rest of the time I was coordinating people and all that, so mm. I can only imagine Stunfest would be pretty crazy. Yeah, it's... A lot of a very big events here. We have a lot of things to organize, a lot of people to manage. <laughs> I can imagine it being a lot of work. Absolutely. So on Friday, did you get a chance to check out or watch Eaglet and Plasmo's demonstration? Yeah, we watched everything. Yeah, We watched all the demonstrations of the, the small demonstrations. Good. What were your thoughts on the demonstration? Uh, the Gwega one? Yes. Uh, it was pretty neat. It was neat to see like the two players at the same time play. Mm-hmm. It's pretty unusual. I don't think you like ever ever really see that. And there's some some if some tournaments. I know some Toho tournaments do that, with like a score competition. Yeah, like in Japan and stuff. What are your thoughts on that sort of format? Do you like it? It's neat, yeah, because it's like more direct competition between the two players mm-hmm. instead of just like watching someone play the game itself. Yeah, gives like maybe more. Commitment to the to the match, maybe I'm not, not sure. A little more of a rivalry aspect. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like with fighting games, I guess. Right, exactly. Kind of fitting for the event. Would you be ever interested in participating in something like that? Maybe, maybe. I've already like participated in the past by uh, just playing one one game. Maybe if they ever allow me. <laughs> sure. Yeah. If if they can't get any like Japanese players, because of course those go first. Right. Because they are the good ones. They are the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think your scores are anything to sneeze at, though, for sure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I also definitely wanted to ask you, you know, I've watched your To All of the Black Label, you know, the video you put up dozens of times at this point. Uh, which one? Diojo? Yeah, Diojo. Sorry. Diojo, okay. Yeah, there are, there are a couple of black labels, so... <laughs> I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on Foo Foo Foo's run of White Label on Friday. Yeah, that was a really amazing, amazing one. <laughs> it was very, very hype. Yeah. I must say. It developed like, a couple of times I thought that uh, there was no way he was going to recover, but he still did. <laughs> I know, I thought the same thing. But see, like, white, white Label is very, like, very unforgiving. Like, if you make like one mistake in a bad place, the one is almost already immediately over. I imagine. As far as clear goes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like super scary thing to do. It's the, like the most marathon unfriendly game I can possibly imagine. I know, it's so brutal. So so scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Like the amount of the amount of balls he has to do that. <laughs> the amount of balls he has to uh, play that on an event like that. It's crazy. I know. No margin for error, basically. Do you have any interest in playing uh white label as far as getting a two all in that or uh, I played it a bit like earlier, but I didn't like finish it. I should go back to it like at some point to get uh, to get the two all. Yeah. Last month or so, I was working on a one all of 
white label. And then mm. Plasmo said, you know, you should play black label. It's easier. And I switched over. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, black label is quite a lot easier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you get the opportunity to get your hands on the XR Arcadia then? Uh, yeah, you could. Yeah, they were like lined up there. So you could like play all the way uh, in the, to the event. You could play on them. So I did, yeah. <laughs> awesome. What are your thoughts on it? It's it's a very neat system. It's, it's very slick looking, first of all. It, 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 it controls pretty well, and it's, it looks nice. It's definitely pretty neat, I think. And the games were, of course, cool as well. Absolutely. So what did it kind of look like from an exterior that really caught your eye? What aspects looked good? It's like pretty tall, and it, it catches, catches, your, catches your eye, uh, definitely. Mm. It's, it's pretty, it looks very nice. And uh, what kind of screen was on it? Was it a, like an LCD type screen or was it a CRT? I think it was LCD. I'm not sure on that though. Wasn't like a standard arcade cabinet then from... No, it was nothing like that. Oh, okay. Looked completely different. So um, what games did you get to play on it? There was Aqua to Blue, first of all. Mm -hmm. with the, uh, from the former cave developers. There was also uh, the Super Hydora game. And there was supposed to be another game there, but they didn't manage to get it to work, unfortunately. It was uh, another one of the, another Dojin game. I uh, can't remember the name right now. It was also on, it's also on Steam, just like Super Hydora. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's a, a game you can already play in some form or another. Yeah, but it's like heavily adjusted for uh, like an arcade format. So what were your thoughts on... AKA or Akata Blue, however it's pronounced. <laughs> I think it's like really neat the game. It's very reminiscent of like a cave game for sure. It reminds me a lot of like Side Eye Ojo. Mm -hmm. It looks like, like it. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like level design and stage design, pattern design, that stuff, it's very, very cave reminiscent. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to play. Patterns are fun to dodge. I was watching some gameplay of it and I was trying to figure is there a laser in that game or is it just concentrated bullets? There's no laser, no. Okay. You can slow down by like holding the button, mm -hmm. but as far as I know, that only slows you down. There's no like special laser or anything. Oh yeah, I was, I was watching some replays of it, and I was like, just trying to figure: is there a laser going to come out of this thing at any point or not? <laughs> yeah. No, I do think there's like a laser aura when you like focus, but I'm not completely sure on that. Oh, that's good. Because I was like tapping like at the bottom of the screen, and popcorn were like just going from the left inside of me, and I didn't die. So I guess there's like an aura or something like that. And how would you say, as far as difficulty goes, how hard is that game compared to Dodonpachi games? It's not that hard, I think. But it's also not easy, like in the slightest. Oh, okay. It did took like uh, a couple of tries to uh, reach the end of the game. <laughs> there was only three stages, but it was still like not easy, not trivial to clear it. That's what I heard. And are they planning to have five stages? Is that the kind of plan? I think the, I think the original game has five stages, yeah. The mobile version, that's how long. You can probably get like a sneak peek of the game uh, by playing that. Yeah, I just try to avoid mobile shmups just because, you know, I like to use a joystick and everything. But maybe yeah. it'll be worth it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it might be like, might be fun, like, fun to be like a site that is on the go or something, maybe. I'm not sure. It's definitely like one, a very good one for that. I could see that for sure. And mm -hmm. they did port a lot of the Dodonpachis, or at least DOJ to mobile. I remember that. You could get it on iPhone. Yeah, a lot of stuff came out on the iPhone at some point. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever heard like many good things about it, but <laughs> they're playable, so <laughs> you can have fun on the go, I guess. I wonder how you bomb. You have to touch the screen, I think. Oh, okay. Like, touch it twice or something. Oh, I see. Uh, there was I, there was like a problem with shot, like yeah, you have to constantly keep shooting or don't shoot. That's like some, somewhat of a problem with scoring systems. <laughs> yeah, getting like a nice rapid fire. Probably would be pretty hard on that touch screen. Yeah, you, you, you can't tap the button. You just keep constantly shooting or you don't shoot at all. That's funny. Yeah, like for scoring, you have to like do like strategic taps, strategic tapping at times, and like damage calculation. And you just can't do that on the mobile, on the no, mobile version. not at all. So I guess it's kind of an issue for scoring. Absolutely. So on Friday, you got a chance to try out the XR Arcadia and there were the demonstrations. Were there other things going on that you know, people not at the event might not be aware of? There was like all sorts of stuff happening at that time, like all sorts of little tournaments, demonstrations. There was like a speedrun section, I think, for speedrunning, yeah. Of course, fighting game stuff. Yes. 
there was also like a bar, a bar with sorts of video game music playing. Oh, cool! Like, so it was like a, that was a big section was like dedicated to like Dojin stuff and like upcoming Dojin stuff. Oh, what did you think of that? There was quite a lot of it. Yeah, you could like play them. I didn't really pay too much attention to it. To be right. honest, what was your main focus? What was the thing you were most interested in? At the caps, uh, of course. Yes, <laughs> the shmup caps. What cabinets were there that were really awesome? Yeah, they had like all sorts of stuff. There it was like Mushim Sama Futari. Oh, nice. Oh, so they had a bunch of cave cabinets then. Yeah, Bell Greg, uh, Bat Rider, like that big street sting. Nice. Also, also like Akai Katana Red version, which I think is pretty rare. Yeah, that's a great game. Yeah, that's a special version, like Red, Red version, Akai Katana Red. It's like way harder version of the original game. Oh, wow. I think it's pretty rare. I don't know about the Netherlands. Is there an arcade scene in the Netherlands at all? No. No, just no. <laughs> just nothing, yeah. Oh, I see. Kind of like where I live. Yeah. So as outside of Stunfest, are you ever able to seek these cabinets, you know, these cave cabinets and Battle Grega and stuff like that? No, not really, no. It's like the only, like the only time I can actually play on a cab. Oh, I could definitely see how that would be really cool then. Yeah, it's it's definitely cool like to like see it, see those things in person and play on them. It's a lot different from uh, playing at home. Oh yeah, I know. I've got a chance to go to a few arcades and you know play some of my favorite games on the cabinet themselves. It's a totally different experience. It really is, yeah. So, were you trying to set the high scores on the cabinets? <laughs> uh, I'm not good enough at the uh, at a stick to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, like a lot of games I haven't played in a while, so it's pretty hard. Mm-hmm. It would be cool to like be good at all the games all the time, but <laughs> yeah, that's not something you can do. Really. <laughs> no, not at all. But you are kind of a renaissance man in that you know you have a ton of scores and tons of different games. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So you mentioned you don't play on stick that often. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. What's your kind of main way of playing shmups then? I mostly play on like a, a Sega Saturn pad. It's a, one of the best pads I think out there. I would definitely agree with that. I also have like a I have a, I have an arcade stick like sitting next to me here, but I just can't get used to it. I remember when I first started playing uh, stick in fighting games, especially Tekken. Oh my gosh, it felt weird. It felt really weird. Yeah, you just can't do anything at all. <laughs> I've gotten better at it, but still not nearly as proficient as on pad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think different input methods speak to people differently. You know what I mean? It's definitely a big preference. Yes. Like, I've known people who you have difficulty with stick. I've never really known anyone to have difficulty with pad, but I personally have difficulty with keyboard. I cannot play on keyboard. I've tried hundreds of times. I just suck at it. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> There are very good players that use like keyboard or pad or stick. Mm-hmm. It's, it really does. It really doesn't really matter. I yeah. think it's just what you're used to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm interested. How do you use your Sega Saturn pad for different games? Do you have different converters and stuff to connect it to your PC and other consoles? I have like a USB converter to PC. Mm, yeah. And yeah, for just on PC, I can just use it normally or via or through uh, like expert or something. Right. A joy to key. Yes, exactly. I know that for sure. It's not a problem, though. No. This is a little tangent, but a few years ago, I got kind of a little bit obsessed with the Sega Saturn pad and started collecting all the different variations of it. <laughs> and so there is a USB variation that was made not directly by Sega, but approved by Sega that's pretty close to the original pad. That's pretty good. Yeah, there are also like a lot of knockoffs around <laughs> that are very bad. Yeah, those knockoffs are terrible. The best one, besides the original, is there's this official PS2 version Sega Saturn pad. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, yes. I have, I have one of those, yeah. Yeah, I have one too. I had a, I spent years tracking that bad boy down. Uh, Saucy Cobalt like, gifted me uh, one of those like many years ago, so that was really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a fantastic pad, yeah. It's unfortunately not. It's unfortunately not working anymore. I think, but it's. I still have it around, so it's very nice. Pad. What's wrong with it? Just out of curiosity, because I repair controllers. Uh, I think the the, the D pad is not. I think it's a bit broken. Oh, like, okay. Uh, like the like the thing ripped. Like the thing. Uh, like the plastic thing or whatever ripped inside of it. 
So like those little ball things like keep falling out and mm. then you can't use uh, the direction anymore. The good news is if you do want to re- repair it, just replace it from an original pad. It'll work from an original Sega Saturn pad. Those components mm-hmm. are all the same. Okay. <laughs> I might try. I might try that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to shmups. <laughs> yeah. For the future, do you ever have any interest in doing a demonstration yourself at Stunfest, if that was possible? I did one of those like uh, two years ago. Oh, awesome. I think 2005 or something was that. I gave like a demonstration for uh, Dung and Fibon. Oh, that's really cool. It was also like the first time I uh, came to Stunfest, yeah. That was, that was really cool. And did you do the demonstration on the cabinet? No, it was uh, on the PC. Okay. Yeah, meme. Yeah, not, you're not a stick player, so... There was no other way. Yeah, that would be hard. Definitely. Eaglet was mentioning that during his demonstration, the stick on the cabinet was like kind of recessed into the cabinet too far. So he's having a oh. lot of trouble controlling the ship. Uh, yeah, that's that's one problem with like arcade cabinets. Of course, you're always like stuck with the stick that's on it. Yes. If it's not a good stick, then you're kind of out of luck. <laughs> I know like a couple of years ago, there were like caps that were like really bad. You had to play on like the two player side because the the one player stake was like so bad, <laughs> you couldn't play on it. Everyone like was playing on this on the second player. Yeah, I remember one time I drove two hours to an arcade that all my friends were telling me about. I got there and half their machines were busted. Like their sticks were completely loose. They wouldn't even work. Oh, ah, that's too bad. <laughs> so I was just feeding them quarters for no reason. goes what was the highlight for you what was the big highlight that really i don't know made it an event to remember uh, i'm not sure i i enjoyed everything like pretty equally like, okay. the demonstrations were the demonstrations were super cool like all the cat playing on the castle super cool meeting all the guys and like going out to dinner and stuff it was also like really really fun mm-hmm. uh, i'm not really sh- not really sure i have like specific highlights because i liked all of it to be honest is this kind of the only time of year you get to meet the other European, you know, shmup players? Or do you guys get together other times as well? Mostly, like, the only time. Okay. Yeah, it would be, be fun to, like, meet more, but it's, like, hard to uh, meet up. Yeah, of course, everyone is, like, so spread out. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, we are way spread out from each other. Yeah, like, to go to, like, a faraway place, it has to be, like, really worth it. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to, like, get a lot of people to go if the... Like, the event itself is not, like, spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> and, worth, and worth the trip and money. Yes. But luckily, luckily, Sunfest was, so... Oh, absolutely. It sounded like it. Hopefully it will be next year as well. So do you have any interest in fighting games at all, or not really? Not really, no. <laughs> it's, it's not really my thing. Because one of my thoughts was maybe at Evo, doing a kind of side, you know, get together at Evo. I guess the American players could do this because we're all pretty close, but to kind of have something analogous to Stunfest in America where the American shmup players get together at like Evo or something. Yeah, they might be able to arrange that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think so far there has been anything in America like equal to like Stunfest. Yeah. It would be like hard to uh, organize for sure, but I think it would probably be doable. My thoughts were that, you know, because I have an interest in fighting games. So for me, going to Evo would be awesome because not only would I be playing shmups, but I'd be at, you know, the big fighting game tournament of the world. So like, yeah, well, well, Stunfest is like mostly a fighting game event as well. So it's basically the same thing. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, very similar. 
So shifting gears from Stunfest, I had some other topics I wanted to discuss with you. The first is that, you know, you have this massive resume of, you know, outstanding high scores, at least in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks. And a lot of times when I'm trying to learn how to score, I'll refer to a lot of your videos, be like, oh, I'll watch Jamers and kind of try to emulate what he's doing a little bit. <laughs> That's nice to hear. <laughs> So my first question to you is, when you're approaching a game and deciding to go for a high score in that game, what are your first steps? Like first, I like just like play through the game to get like a feel for it. Mm -hmm. To see uh, yeah, how the stages are laid out, what the enemies' balance are, like like where the hard parts are. Yes. Like kind of based on, I try to figure it out a bit myself first. Uh, after that, I like mostly like look at replay to see what's what's possible, what's available. What you can do or what you can't do like try to copy those and then adjust them to more to like my how i want to play the game yes yes i could see that like some things like work for you and some things don't and the things that don't you just adjust you adjust for yourself for your own route and then just just like keep keep uh, developing that route until you like get something that's really good and consistent mm -hmm. And after that, you like practice it, practice it and grind it for consistency before I do like actual ones. Like stage, you can grind like stages for uh, consistently before you uh, do ones. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I'm sure at your, you know, at your level of experience and skill, that, that process is probably a lot more accelerated for you than I'm sure a lot of people. Yeah, I, I'd say so, yeah. If you have more experience with like routing out games before, then the second, yeah, like the second time, third time, it'll go easier, of course, for sure. And so in those early stages of routing, what I'm really curious about is, do you watch the replay kind of without your own route in mind and kind of just try to watch those replays and then see what you want to adjust? Or do you just play the game without looking at replays, kind of get a rough idea for your routes, and then refer to replays? Uh, the latter, I'd say. Okay. Because... Yeah, there is no meaning to like copying things if you don't know why someone does something. Yeah, then like watch a couple of replays, see like what's everyone, what's like multiple what different people do, mm -hmm. see what like works best for you, what's maybe the easiest, and then like develop it into your own route and like adjust it mm -hmm. till you get something like that's really nice for you, and then you just grind it for consistency before doing real ones, and like doing once, then if you fail something, you go back and practice that again until you uh, get more consistent at it, so you don't fail it next time. Especially when you're getting into those later stages, that's, that's a terrible feeling, when you're so close yeah. and you fail right at the end. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> especially especially the, late, the late game, you have to practice a lot, I think, because it's like the easiest to fail. Yeah. That's the most, uh, most consequences for failure. So when you're grinding out runs, are you using a lot of save states, or are you kind of just taking it beginning of stage, end of stage, in chunks? I'm kind of curious. Uh, it's which I mostly use save states, yeah, if they're available. Yeah, pretty much, like, divide the stages into chunks that you then learn, and then chain together until you do, like, the entire stage in one go. Right, yeah, that's kind of how I approach, too. You can divide stages in, like, sort of certain chunks by how the enemies and uh, patterns are yeah. laid out. So you, like, some, usually there's be, like, a pause or something they can use mm -hmm. as like a, a cutoff point. And then like learn that learn that section until you move up, move further on to the to the next section. And so when you're first learning a game, are you learning it for survival or do you immediately start learning it for score? I always incorporate at least a tiny bit of scoring. Okay, but that's just that's just me. <laughs> right. The most I think. Um, one of the super players once said that you have to be able to clear the game first before you can score in it, which I think is like a good, a good thing to uh, to strive for. Right, I could see that. But if if the scoring is not too hard, it doesn't really matter that much, as long as you scoring is of course not very inconsistent. <laughs> I've thought about that too. I'm kind of at that stage right now where I'm. I've got a lot of one alls in games, and so I need to kind of move forward into either. I'm trying to decide whether to start playing the second loop for survival or to go back and learn scoring for the first loop. What would you suggest? Yeah, like the thing with like, like Daiuju or something. Mm -hmm. Because in the second loop, um, scoring is also like 
kind of survival there. Like if you have if you have chaining roads, then that's basically already a survival road that incorporates that also incorporates scoring. Mm-hmm. As long as like the chaining road isn't too difficult, not too inconsistent, then you basically have a, a survival road with that incorp- also incorporates like scoring. I think that's probably the most ideal thing. Mm-hmm. So when you were learning these, you know, especially Dodonpachi games, because they have the second loop and everything, when you got your one all, did you immediately start playing the second loop for survival? Or did you say, oh, okay, I need to go back and try to get higher scores in the first the first loop? I just learned the second loop first. Okay. Because you can always improve your first loop when doing runs mm-hmm. and doing two all attempts. Because you're playing the, sec- the first loop anyway every time, so... Very true. Very true. I've been trying, I've been going back and forth between which way to go as far as doing that. You can always like learn more scoring in the first loop as long as uh, it doesn't impact like your survivability too much. You have to always try for like that balance between like risk and reward. I was about to say that, yeah. Like if the risk is too high, then the reward is not really worth it at that stage. Exactly. Yeah, I, I remember. Not too long ago, I was going for a one-all clear of DOJ, and I decided I would try to really maximize my score in the first two stages. I ended up blowing myself up over and over and over and over. Yeah. At one point, I was like, forget it. I'm just going to play it how I normally play it. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the first thing you should strive for is just consistency, yeah? Yeah, exactly. The most safe, safe possible way you wrote, you can imagine. Even for scoring, you have to always try for like the safest possible thing, safest possible route to take so that you take the least amount of risk and that you like have the least amount of risk of dying and have to reset. Yeah, I know. That's that's not a fun feeling at all. So I'm curious, going back into your own you know personal history of shmups, I'm interested to hear kind of your development as a shmup player, you know, from kind of being a noob to where you are now. <laughs> Uh, it started like a long time ago. I think I saw at some point I saw like someone playing a Toho game. <laughs> it, it looked it looked really cool. I wanted to try it for myself, so I did. It was like of course really hard, but <laughs> yeah. Eventually, eventually I managed to like clear like a normal mode or something. And then I discovered that there was a community for it. There was a forum for it. People were also playing the games, doing all sorts of challenges for it. Mm-hmm. And it was it was it was fun to join them. And then you gradually got better as you played the games with the other players. And what year was this that you kind of got into shmups? I think that was 2009, I believe. It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, like on that same duo form, at some point, there was also like a thread for other shmups, for other arcade shmups. Mm-hmm. We had like uh, like weekly weekly tournaments, play like for a week, uh, play like a game for a week to see who gets the highest score. Oh, that's cool. That was pretty fun. Like, if, like eventually the people in the chat like made uh, the team for like SCG, SCGT. Oh really? On the form. Yeah, that's that's where it origin that's where it originated from. It originated from a Toho forum. Yes, yes. I did not know that. So yeah, we we just joined as a team and decided to play along with uh, on the Shmops forum. It was uh, turned out to be pretty fun. <laughs> that's really cool to learn that your kind of first introduction to Shmops was through Toho. Yeah, it's for a lot of people, I think. That's really cool. I guess, how did you get your eyes on a Toho game? How were you exposed to a Toho game, I guess is what I'm asking. I just saw, like, a random YouTube video. Oh, there you go. (laughs) That was basically it. (laughs) (laughs) It looked fun, I wanted to play it, and so I did. Was it one of the ones for the PC, or was it one of even the older, like, Windows 98 ones? Yeah, it was one of the Windows ones. I think it was, like, Perfect Cherry Blossom. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm familiar with that one. And so I can imagine coming from Toho, you get your hands on a cave game and, you know, it feels very familiar. Yeah, I think Toho is like a pretty good like starting point for like beginners because Toho like teaches you a lot about like war dodging ability because the games are like very random yes. in nature. Yeah. So they like also teach you like a lot of stuff like streaming, like some, like some one of the games like pretty much forces you to learn more advanced techniques, like I think one of the photo games. Yeah. To act, or you can actually like continue on with it. So I think they're like pretty good. Like one of one of the games is also like just pure random dodging. Oh really? Yeah, I think the like the versus game is like mostly just random stuff. <laughs> like the twink the twinkle star sprites clone. 
Oh, okay. So you like develop, you like develop like war dodging ability, and you develop like the more advanced stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's like that, that like all transitions over into like arcade shmups as well, of course. Yes, I've been trying to just work on those kinds of base skills that you're talking about. Like one of my goals is to be able to approach kind of shmups I'm unfamiliar with and still be able to, I guess, react reactively dodge things or read read patterns extremely quickly and dodge them without being mm. too familiar with them. Yeah, the the random dodging, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely something that you develop over time. Yes. By just doing it by just doing it a lot. It's definitely like a separate skill, I think. Definitely a separate skill set. And I think uh one aspect that helped me a lot was learning kind of what to watch. I feel like I'm getting better at figuring out what I need to be actually be watching. Yes, yes, yes. Like, like in the beginning, I think you mostly like focus on your own hitbox, mm-hmm. and that's like not really the best thing to do. Yeah, because you you, most, you mostly need to, need to look at like the bullets that are coming at you, like more on the top of the screen. Exactly. And, like gradually, and gradually, like you go more away from looking at your own ship to looking at like the rest of the screen. Uh huh. You, you can instinctively, instinctively, like, uh, like feel where you are on the screen without even looking at it. Yes. That's something you develop over time. Yes, I was going to ask you that. One thing I've been trying lately is to try and do exactly what you're saying, is try to dodge things without even looking at my ship, just by feeling where it is. Is mm. Did you ever consciously try and work on that, or is that just a kind of a talent that you developed over time? It kind of happens like naturally, I think. Okay. It's like using your peripheral vision to like look at uh, your own, your own uh, ship. Yes. And the other bullets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some of my favorite patterns I found are the ones where they're kind of sort of random, the patterns that they're throwing at you, and you just have to kind of reactively dodge to the bullets. Like, um, have you played Esperade? Esperade, yes, I Esperade. have. Esperade, okay, whoops. <laughs> Esperade, my pronunciation is not great. I think you're right. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it either, though. <laughs> I think you're right. Okay. Esperade. Esperade, Esperade. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> in the fourth stage the one where there's that mech and it shoots all the pink bullets in one of its patterns those st- or like the blue swirling ones i love those styles of boss patterns to dodge uh, which boss is this it's it's like a it's like a mech boss it looks like a gundam is that stage four stage four i believe or it's like it's in the sub it's in the subway yeah the subway yes, stage the subway stage yeah uh-huh Yes, I know that. I know that. I know that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think like Aspirate has like some of the coolest patterns and cave ever made. To be honest, it's a super cool game. Yeah, it's really growing on me. I've been playing it a bunch lately, and I'm like, wow, this game is so fun. Yeah, it's just like such a tragedy that like the scoring is so busted on the game because the game itself is like so cool and like the patterns are so cool, so fun, so good. But then you have like scoring, and that's like. Uh... <laughs> Can you explain what aspects of the scoring are busted? The the, the spell the spell shots. You know what that is, right? Yes. The secondary shot. Yes. If you um, hit something with it, you get like a non-trivial amount of score for it, and you can use like a tiny, tiny part of the spell shot to like hit the boss with it, and you just milk that like forever and forever. Oh, okay, I see. It's it takes like so long to milk every boss like that. Oh, yeah, I could see why that would be really tedious. It's literally like 10 minutes or something. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate because I really like that game. And it's like my least played cave game because of that. Right. Because of that scoring, scoring thing, even though I really like the game. Yeah. yeah. Also, the hitbox is not super great in that game. Yeah. Like the, hitbox is, the hitbox is in like the neck of the ship. Of yes. The player, the player character. That's like that's that's very off center. There's been times where I've been dodging bullet patterns and my guy dies and I'm confused. I'm like, why did I get killed? It's like really really uncomfortable if you're not really used to the neck hitbox. Did they fix that in Espigaluda? The hitbox? Yeah, yeah, they did. Oh, that's it's, good. It's actually centered in that game. Sometimes I wish, you know how they do ROM hacks for older games, like older Super Nintendo games and stuff? Mm. Sometimes I wish there was a ROM hack community for shmups, where they'd go in and fix things like Esperade or make remixes and stuff like that. Trap, 5- Trap 15 kind of did that with, uh, with a few games. That's awesome. 
I know we made like a hack for like Sami Sami Sami, the, the dual plan game. Oh really? Yeah, he he like changed the more bad things about that game, like the like power ups like sticking around forever. That's really cool. Like minor things that really made the game annoying to play. Mm-hmm. Like made it better. That's really cool. It's cool, yeah. <laughs> it's it's unfortunately that I don't think many people play that hack though. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I had no idea about it. Yeah, because if you're going to play the game, that, then you might as well like play the, the real game, I right, think. Right, I see. Like the thought behind it. Uh-huh. But, like, but the hack is cool for like people who just want to play the game. Yeah, who don't really care about, you know, chasing mm, scores and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So other than Esperade, is there another shmup that you really enjoy playing, but has this problem with scoring or some other issue that prevents you from... Really getting too into it? Can't really think anything right now. That's fine. <laughs> there, probably, there, there probably is, but not on the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. There are a lot of games that have like something wrong with them. <laughs> yeah. That can that can really ruin the experience. There's also like I think with Fatari Ultra where like some like the stage one boss has like, can choose between like two random attacks and one of them is, one of them is like really really difficult and the other one is trivial. Oh can, man. Yeah, you can just that can just waste a bomb for no reason, and that's really annoying and stupid. <laughs> oh yeah, that's terrible when that ha- when that happens. Like gets to yes, like that that bug with that one up just es- just escapes <laughs> in stage five. Oh I've, yeah, I remember hearing about that on the STG Weekly. Like all all these tiny little things that can be really annoying, or spread out over a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. A lot of games have those quirks, don't they? Yeah. your impressions on the Dodon Pachi series because that's my favorite shmup series currently and you have replays and you know I don't know all the games but most of them mm, I've played most of them yeah yeah so I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on I guess as the series has evolved and changed what aspects of the changes that you liked what aspects you didn't like things like that so I guess the first one mm. I want to ask you about is the change from Dodonpachi to DOJ. Of the two, mm. which do you prefer? I am currently playing like Dodonpachi right now to get a high score in it. Awesome. I think probably say like DOJ is better because right. it's just better designed. Like DDP is very cool because it's very simple, very straightforward. Yes, you yes, just, exactly. You just chain and that's pretty much it. <laughs> And yeah, like even if you break the chain, it's not that bad because you can just pick it up immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in DOJ, that's harder because breaking the chain means you lose like hypermeter, and you have to like adjust for that. Yeah, you need to have a lot of backup routes in order to adjust. That's not a thing in in DDP. But the problem with DDP is that like the, f- the first three stages, like one, one, two, one, three, are like not very exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially one, three is. Just plain bad, to be honest. What aspects of that stage do you hate the most? It's just complete filler. It's just like nothing to do in it. It's like a long process of nothing happening. That stage. Yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with that stage too. The thing I like about it is the boss The boss fight at the end. The boss is, is cool, but it's, it lasts like really long as well. Yeah, it goes on forever. Mm-hmm. You have to do that stage every single one, and that can get annoying over time. Yeah, pretty tedious. Like DOJ is like really well designed. There's, it's just nothing boring in it. There's, everything is unique, exciting. Not a single second is wasted. It's probably like super one of the best designed shmups in my opinion, DOJ. I would agree. From what I have played so far, I've played quite a few. 
not quite at high levels, but enough to get one alls in them and stuff. Even at high level, DOJ remains fun to play, I think. That's awesome. My thoughts on the difference between the two is the original Donanpachi was kind of the first shmup I really got into and kind of fell in love with. So mm. there's aspects of that game that I really enjoy. It's just really fun to play as far as I feel comfortable recommending that to casual players because it's so mm. just pick up and play. It's a very good game for beginners, yeah. It's easy to understand and it's not that hard. You can clear it like even if you're not that good yet. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's a very fun game as well, of course. Especially like 1, 4, 2, uh, especially stage 4 to stage 6. The yes. last two stages are really good. Yeah, they are. I really enjoy the final stage. The only problem I have is just a little personal problem is sometimes I can't see those little thin blue bullets and I just randomly explode as I'm playing because <laughs> I can't see them. But other than that... Like the small needle, the blue needle things? Yeah, those tiny blue needles, the really thin ones. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. It has to do with the colors of the stage. I kind of have a little bit of color blindness going on, and mm. they blend in with the stage so well sometimes that I just don't even see them. Yeah, I can't imagine that being a problem if you're colorblind. <laughs> I'm not super colorblind, but mm. a little bit, so mm. it's a little bit difficult for me. Yeah, and I know some people who are also colorblind, and like they, some parts of games are like way harder for them <laughs> than they should be. <laughs> The coloring of that stage is there's a lot of blues and reds, and they blend in with the bullets. Or blues and pinks, yeah. and they blend in with yeah. the bullets. I can imagine that, yeah. <laughs> like, Greg also has like a bit of a visual, visibility problem, but mm-hmm. you, can, you can get used to it if you play it for long enough. So then, going from DOJ to Daifuketsu, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? Daifukats, I think. Okay. Daifukats. To me, it feels like a pretty big shift, you know? Is that sound accurate to you, or not that much of a change? Uh, I think the biggest change is like how the hyper system works. It's yeah, how it, it's it's a lot different, yeah, because the way like scoring works in that game is that um, you don't actually like get any score unless you're out of hyper and hyper beta is completely full. So like the the rows consist of like backing the chain meter up, like the hit counter up at the start of the stage using a hyper. And riding out the stage without using any hypers. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a different approach to how you uh, how you play the game. Yeah, and then there's the whole power mode where you can switch your ship's shot types oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Do you ever play with that mode or that t- style of ship? Uh, I haven't personally played the game with that style, mm. but I've heard it's like the most the definite way to like play the game for score. It seems. That's the kind of style I play, just because I kind of think it's pretty fun. But mm. I'm curious to hear someone else's opinion. It's it's most definitely the easiest to score with, like yeah. the power style. Mm-hmm. Because the, like the hyper strength is also like really powerful, so it's easier to cancel bullets and get more hits. And the only problem is that uh, the game becomes like virtually unclearable. <laughs> really? <laughs> because Hibachi he is like so ridiculously hard with power style. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> It's like almost unclearable. It's like one of the hardest clears, cave clears because of that. I had no idea about that. Yeah, you don't have any bombs for Hibachi, so... Uh, oh, that's right. That that's, gets kind of difficult. Oh, I bet. Mm. Is Dodonpachi Resurrection a re-release of that game? It's just uh, the, the localized name, pretty much. Okay. Daifukas just means resurrection. Oh, okay. So, because I see the separate listings... And I've always wondered, is that the same game? It's just English ver- the English version, basically. Okay. I don't think there are any differences. I don't think so either. I was playing both versions, and I feel like these, are, these feel like the same game. Like, the title screens and stuff are different, but... Like, there are some differences between, like, the Steam version and, like, the 360 version. Mm-hmm. But that's not to do with, like, the actual name of it. Like, all the ports have, like, something with them. Yeah, there's different issues with the different ports. For instance, mm. the DOJ ports are pretty different from each other, for sure. The uh, 360 and the PS2. I think those ports are like fine now. Like the 260 one had a lot of issues at first because there was like so many loading times. Oh yeah, I know. I I tried it. it it's probably I timed it. It's probably a minute and thirty seconds loading into mm. the game. It's seen. It's insane. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty bad, yeah. But like many years later, like many years later, the game, the game. Uh, Got a patch that like reduces the loading times. Yeah. So it's it's a bit better now. 
I think the PS2 port is really fine. I don't think I've ever heard anything about that. Yeah, I have the PS2 port. It's excellent. The only thing about it is it's just white label. There's no black label. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And the PS2 port has the death label version, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah. And it also has a really good training mode in it, whereas the 360 version just, oh, has, yeah. <laughs> just has a like, busted stage select. It's probably like the worst practice mode I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just select your stage, and you're going to start that stage with no power-ups or anything. You don't get any power at all, no. <laughs> you just start like stage 5 with, uh, with zero power. You can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's terrible. Oh, man. So going from Daifuketsu or Daifuku... Okay, I'll edit that in correct, however it's pronounced. But <laughs> <laughs> to SDOJ, what do you think about SDOJ? Yeah, SDOJ is a really cool game. It's a lot of fun to play. Scoring-wise, it's like a bit silly, especially because of like the overflow bug that it has. Oh, really? Can you explain about that? Uh, like, SDOJ, like, it, it still has the chaining, but the chaining is not really that relevant. Mm -hmm. Of course, the chaining is, like, really lenient, and that's not, like, the main focus of main focus of the scoring system. Because the main focus of the scoring system is bullet cancelling. Oh, okay. Because that also gives you, like, the hypers and the hit count. Mm -hmm. Every cancelled every cancelled bullet gives you, like, plus one to the hit counter. And, like, the chaining is, like, really lenient, and... Uh, also has like the, the rank and like the thing with the rank is that the higher the rank the faster the bullets get that's like the only change but because like the score system is mostly bullet cancelling the higher the, the bullets the faster the bullets are the faster they leave the screen and so you get less less cancels so you so you want the rank to be as low as possible because that way you get the most bullets on screen to cancel interesting so like the optimal scoring route is to like completely ignore the first four stages. I don't do anything in them. Just get to stage five with zero rank and then then start scoring. Then just rack it up, huh? That's where the game begins basically. Stage five. The rest of the game's irrelevant. That is funny. And am I right that there's no second loop, right? No, uh, there is no second loop, no. Interesting. There is an expert mode. Oh if okay. you like pick uh if you pick the expert mode. And that, that's like super, it's a super difficult mode, for sure. And I'd even say the base mode is pretty difficult as well. It's like on par, on par with Futari Ultra, easily. You also only get like one bomb for that mode, so it also makes it a lot more difficult. One bomb with life. Oh, jeez. Have you ever cleared that mode? Uh, I have, yeah. I was just playing SDOJ for the first time last weekend. I was mm. just the first few stages seemed like they're throwing the kitchen sink at you compared to some of the other Donumpachi games as far as difficulty wise. Yeah, it's it's a pretty tough one, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like it they made it a lot easier with uh Daifu cuts and then made it a lot harder again with Sarai Ujo. Yeah. It was like kind of their like the last game. It was like the Keith's Swan song, so they like went all out on it. Just made it however they wanted it to be. Without like really paying attention to other things, I think. So of all the Dodonpachi games at this point, which one stands out to you as your favorite? Probably say like the like the UJ, to be honest. It just it has the most lasting appeal out of any of the games. Yeah, and even aesthetically, that's definitely my favorite as far as aesthetics and like the music. It's fantastic. Yeah, if I like were to choose like a game to like go all out in, in terms of score. Scoring that game that you play for like years. Mm -hmm. I'll probably I'll probably pick like like the OJ Black Label or something. What state that has the most lasting appeal in terms of like in terms, in terms of gameplay and scoring? Yeah, I know the game. The more you play it, the just more fun it becomes. It does, yeah. There's nothing like really annoying about it. Annoying things, any flaws or anything. Yeah, I can't pick any out that come to mind. No. So it's so it's basically like the perfect score game. Yeah. <laughs> I remember playing for my one all. It took me forever to finally get it. And I'd assumed going up until, because I spent a few months working on that. And I was like, okay, once I get this one all, I'm not playing this game for a long time. And then I got mm. it and I immediately wanted to play some more. It has, it's like addictive. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's just never like a boring moment in that game. It's really good.
personally, what is your favorite shmup? Probably like the game I played the most is probably like Katsui. Okay. I really like that game, yeah. It's it's an ex- exceptionally fun game to play. I'd probably pick that, yeah. As your favorite? Yeah. Yeah, that game seems really deep and interesting. I've played a little bit of it, but haven't really, you know, sunk my teeth into it yet. It's very fun to play just for like, to a, to a certain point, I like the scoring gets like a bit silly at a certain point, but until that point, it's like a really fun game to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the, amp- the empty lock stuff, that sort of thing. It's uh, not really. Mm. <laughs> but you can, st- you can still get like over 400 million without it. Yeah, it strikes me as a very unique game too. You know, the helicopter and just it the is, way it yeah. plays. Feels really unique. The design and patterns are definitely unique. Is there a new port of that coming out? Or I know there is a Ketsui point. I don't know if it's of that version though. Coming out yeah, from M2? M2. M2 is bringing out a new port for Ketsui, yeah. Yeah, I bet that'll be awesome. It's, it's definitely going to be like the definite version mm-hmm. for Ketsui. Because all the... The previous ports weren't, like, completely perfect. Yeah, the PS3 and the Xbox. Yeah. Yeah, they ran, like, a tiny bit too fast, and there was, like, a missing slowdown, especially in the Ura loop. Oh, jeez, yeah. That was a bit of an issue, yeah. Yeah, Like, the first loop loop was completely fine, but the loops were not completely... (laughs) Not accurate, huh? Nah. Yeah, I remember one day I was playing an emulator, uh, Final Burn Alpha, I think DOJ. And that emulator does not emulate the slowdown properly. And mm. it took me a few runs to figure out what was going on. I was like, why is this game so damn hard today? <laughs> and I realized there's yes. no slowdown going on here. It's always fun when there's no slowdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like all the, like the, the early like meme dumps of the, like the later cave games all had like no slowdown at all. Oh, man. Playing, like playing ultra mode or something like yeah. without slowdown. No kidding. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> Not very playable. That's interesting going forward as far as like the EXA because probably hardware-wise, we're getting to the point where slowdown probably isn't necessary. No, it was never necessary to put the, you know. Right. Like Cave just like was just working on like extremely shitty hardware even at that even for that time. Really? So they had to, yeah. Yeah, it was like it was like a toaster or something. It's <laughs> it, funny. It, they were working on something like hardware from like the nineteen seventies or something in nineteen ninety. It was extremely bad. That makes sense because I remember thinking the other day about some of the later cave games that have slowdown and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was wondering, you know, around this time, you know, they were running like Tekken Four and all these like three D hardware accelerated games. Are these bullets really causing that much stress to these? <laughs> <laughs> they were still using like really bad hardware, even for side I would do. There you go. Like the reason why stage one is the length it has is because it needs that time to load the stage one boss. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not joking about that. <laughs> That's funny. Why were it's they working <laughs> on such dated hardware? Was it just money, money issues or? I have no idea, but it worked out, I guess. Like, they, they pretty much, like, invented, like, a special sort of gameplay that involves, like, the slowdown mechanic. Yeah, it's almost like a bullet time mode or something. Yeah, and it, it is fun to, like, work around slowdown, because you can, like, make more tight dodges that way. Yes. Sometimes I feel like you do more damage during slowdown. Would you say that possible, or am I just kind of imagining that? I'm not sure, like, all sorts of weird stuff goes on during slowdown. Sometimes I feel like... When I'm shooting ships and stuff during slowdown, I'm doing more damage to them faster than during regular speed. So it's something you can definitely notice during slowdown is that um, like games that have input lag, like Sade Ojo, mm-hmm. during the slowdown, you can definitely feel that it's <laughs> gotten way worse <laughs> in terms of input lag. Yeah. So yeah, that can be a thing. So at Stunfest, of all the XR Arcadia games you played and all the kind of newer stuff coming out, what are you looking forward to the most? In terms of XR Arcadia? Or the games they demonstrated there? Apparently there are like 20 new shmups or something coming out for the Arcadia system, XR Arcadia system. The unfortunate thing though is that I can't really get play them unless you go to like a Japanese arcade. Yeah. So it's, so it's, it's hard 
to get excited over it. I'm excited that like new games are being made, mm-hmm. but it's it's also sad that you, yeah, going to be able to play them. <laughs> like there's like going Border Down Two or something is coming out, like Border Down HD. Yeah, but those are Xia Arcade only. So oh really? Like I'm happy that they're being made in the first place, but and that people get to enjoy them. Just yeah, kind of bit sad that you can't play them yourself. You know, my, my kind of hope with the XR Arcadia, because I know exactly what you're saying, because I'll probably never play one in my life, mm. is that they kind of renew interest in the Japan scene and more yeah. Japan developers start making more shmups and then trickle them on down to us through either Steam ports or, you know, PS4 ports, whatever. Yeah, in order for like XR Arcadia to succeed, they need to have a lot of exclusives. And that's going to stay a while for uh, quite a while. Oh yeah. Like the like like the chance of like a port or something showing up is like minimum of five years, I think. Really? Down the line. Oh yeah. Dang. It's going to, it's <laughs> going to take a while. <laughs> but that's what the system needs. That's exclusivity. Yeah, exactly. It's unfortunate for like us, but if it helps to develop new games mm-hmm. that you can maybe eventually down the line play, then nothing can really say about it. You know, I think one of the problems with, you know, like Cave and all those guys is that the arcade business in Japan isn't what it once was. And so they're not... No, it's it's rapidly dying. Yeah. So they're not making the money they once did. Mm. And then that affects us in the US because we don't get, you know, ports of new Dodonpachi games or ports of, you know, newer kind of higher budget shmup titles, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's unfortunate. I was also wanting to ask you, getting back to Ketsu, I remember... How, did you get a chance to play the M2 port of Battle Garega? A funny story, actually. At Stunfest, they were showing like the, the M2 Katsui. Mm-hmm. Play, you could play like uh, one of the special modes there. Oh, cool! And like everyone who managed to got to uh, Doom in that in that mode, <laughs> they got like a prize. Nice. I got like the limited edition PlayStation 4 um, Garega port. <laughs> you won it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Unfortunately, I don't have a PS4, so I can't actually play it. <laughs> they might have to like buy the console at some point. Just frame it, hang it on mm. your wall, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't no, I haven't played it yet, no. <laughs> That's the one with the like it comes with the art book and the soundtrack and all that stuff. Yeah, and the, like the metal as well, yeah. Cool. Well, ironically enough, the game is not in there. It's just a download code for the game. Yeah, so. it's just that code, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you can enjoy the artwork and the soundtracks. I can, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. That would have been cool if they would have given you like a special edition of the Ketsui when it's released or something. That would have been cool too. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Anyway, I was asking you about that because I got my hands on that port a few months ago and I was extremely impressed with the job they mm. did. It had save states. They actually had a lag reduction feature in there. Just all the things I want to see in ports, they had. Yeah, it's the M2 ports are basically like just the perfect port that you can possibly imagine. It's just everything is good about it in every way. I remember when I found out there were save states in it, I couldn't believe it. Because even... Yeah, I just, you, you don't see that often, no? <laughs> no, because the problem I always had is even really good ports of shmups... I mean, it's hard to beat stuff like save states when it comes to yeah. Yeah. a feature. So that's yeah. really cool they put that in there. And I'm hoping the Katsui port has that as well. You can really see like the passion they have for shmups. Mm-hmm. I'm two guys. It's really good. Yeah, I'm excited to see what else. That would be great if they could port over, you know, just as many games as possible at that quality. Yeah, they're definitely like fans of shmups. A lot, a lot of love, of love and passion goes into those ports and it's amazing. Yeah. It's something you wish you saw more on the on the market, but unfortunately. Yeah, for instance, I got the recent port of Ikaruga for the Switch, mm. and I thought it was okay, but I mean, you go from an M2 port that has save states, that has all these crazy features, and the Ikaruga port on the Switch has a stage select that doesn't even have a restart function. You have to go back to the title menu and... Mm, yeah. It's just the Steam, the Steam version also has that, I think. Yeah, it just compared to those M2 ports, it's definitely feels almost Lacking, lazy. Yeah. <laughs> feels almost lazy, yeah. you know. And the hard part for me is, you know, people who don't play shmups a lot or not that into the genre, to them it feels like, you know, those ports are 
pretty awesome. They have all these little features and everything, but for people who play, you know, shmups a lot and play on MAME and use training modes and stuff, when those modes are gone, it almost feels kind of like the port's incomplete, at least to me. Yeah, it is. Like, I remember, like, when the Darius Burst Chronicle Saviors came out on Steam, the port. Like, the game was basically just, like, an EXE that plays the, the arcade game. That was, like, very bare bones. <laughs> there was no practice mode at all. That sucks. So, yeah. It was not very good now. Yeah, or there's a lot of ports, shmup ports coming out of the Psycho games. Mm. And it's funny because I've heard the PCBs of the Psycho games have this kind of pseudo training mode in them. Where yeah, you can do yeah, stage yes. and stuff. And the ports don't even have that. It's not very good. Yeah, so it's funny is I have Gunbird officially on my Switch. And then I also got my Switch to run Final Burn Alpha emulator. And I just use the emulator because I can use save states and all this. And the official port doesn't have that. It's weird, yeah. When, when like, the, not, the non-official stuff is, like, better. Yeah, that is weird, isn't it? So for you personally, are there any shmups coming out that you're really excited about playing or getting your hands on? Not a whole lot coming out, is there? <laughs> the M2 stuff is obviously... Yeah, very good. The Katsui one, that's definitely going to be awesome. Like maybe that game from um, Qt, the, the guys that made Eskatos and uh, Ginga Force. Mm-hmm. They're making a new shmup that's, I think, uh, Natsuki's Chronicles. But that game has been in like development limbo for like many, many years now. Oh. I'm not sure if it's ever coming out at this point. And with the doujin scene, is there any kind of stuff that you're aware of? Because I noticed, I watch your channel quite a bit, you play quite a few doujin games and stuff. And... Yeah, there's always like a cool doujin coming out, like every few months, so that's, that's cool. There's one, a really good one, that's called Rolling Gunner. Rolling Gunner. Oh. That's made from like former cave employees, I think, as well. Yeah, similar to Arca to Blue. That's cool. It's a really good, yeah. It looks very good. I'm very excited for it. It's currently only a demo, so... Oh, not fully released yet, huh? Nah. It looks extremely good. It's also very, like, Saito Ojo-esque. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when I think about, you know, kind of the state of shmups and stuff, I almost feel like right now, doujins are kind of filling in the gap, as best they can at least, of... Yeah, bas basically, yeah. And so what I hope one day might happen is one of these doujin developers just finds success and kind of scales up their production and scales things up to where they start releasing, you know, really high quality games and become kind of like a, a smaller studio rather than just a doujin developer. Mm. That's a dream I have. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but... <laughs> yeah, maybe with like XA Arcadia, that can happen. Yeah. Because like a lot of doujin games, they, uh, they are taking a lot of doujin games and like developing them for an arcade format. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. Or even, you know, now that we're kind of getting to a world where arcades are not what they once were, you know. Some mm. of these doujin developers can find success maybe on something like Steam or PS4 Online, you know, stuff like that, and kind of just build their own series. Mm. Oh, sorry, one second. No, thank you. Oh, no sorry. service today? Um, I'll be out in a minute. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm at a hotel and they're knocking on my door. <laughs> Did you hear them yelling at me? <laughs> yeah, a tiny bit. <laughs> anyway... I guess to close things off, is there anything else about Stunfest you feel like people who were not at the event, you know, really missed out on and you'd like to tell, tell us about? Um, I think like the coolest part was just meeting everyone, having a good time, having fun. So like, that was mostly like the coolest thing about the event. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you said, it's one of the few chances shmup players get to hang out with each other since we're so spread out from each other. Yeah, that's correct. I'm excited to hear you're working on a high score for Dodonpachi. How far along are you in that process? Uh, I've been like casually playing it a bit. I'm currently at like 476 million. Oh, wow. I want to get it to like 600 million or something. What are you aiming for? What's the score you're aiming for? Uh, 600 million. And my memory's a little foggy. What's the Western record right now? A banana medic like recently improved it to like six thirteen million or something. Oh, okay. But for a very long time, it was like uh, Prometheus was the best. Yes, I've watched that run a million times. Mm, yeah, I think there was like five twenty million or something. But there, there is that was a different, completely different ship though. That's I do have to say that. Oh, what ship are you using? 
banana medic also used and i also used like the c shot c l c oh, laser oh okay yeah cuz uh prometheus mm. used al yes yes and like in my opinion that ship is like way harder to use <laughs> especially for the second loop it's way harder to survive in the second loop with that ship yeah it feels that way i've been playing the second loop with it that's the mm. ship i like to use and you have to like speed kill everything just to survive <laughs> yeah so i'm not really sure if the scores are very comparable but <laughs> Right, yeah. But 600 million is basically just no miss, no bomb to the 2-6 boss and then have decent chaining. Like full chain at least, like the most stages. Oh, do you? Yeah. Is it easier to chain with the C ship with the shot than AL? I believe the first loop is easier with AL, but the second loop is easier with CL. Oh, I see. I believe. I'm not sure I haven't played AL very much, but the the chaining rules are like completely different. Right. I know in DOJ, in the second loop, the you know it's much more lenient. Is that true in DDP as well, as far yeah, as it's... the combo and everything? It's for every Donbachi game, yeah. Oh, okay. Except like Donbachi, but that's something different. <laughs> right, yeah. The second loop, we have more lenient chaining, yeah. The first loop is always like um, easier survival, harder chaining, and then the mm-hmm. second loop is harder survival and easier chaining. Yeah, I know, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's really changes the dynamic of how you approach and play the game in the second loop. Would you say, for yourself, do you enjoy playing the second loop more than the first in most Dodonpachi games? Uh, I like the survival in the second loop, but the first loop is fun because the chaining is more harder. Right. So even though it's easier for survival, it's still hard to chain, so it keeps it stays, it stays interesting. Keeps you on your toes. Yeah. I know, isn't that brilliant game design on Cave's part? It kind of is, yeah. <laughs> because it keeps the new players interested, because at that point, they're just doing their best to survive this first loop. Mm. And then the veteran players are still interested because they're chaining, and it doesn't affect new players because new players don't know how to chain or don't care about it. Yeah. There's also the thing that you have to, like, no miss to bomb the first loop. So right. that's also... <laughs> yeah, to really mm. get that maximum bonus and everything. Yeah. It's pretty well thought out, I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, man, it's been awesome having you on the episode. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we head out? I think we've, like, talked about everything. (laughs) I think it's already been a while, yeah. It's like an hour and a half. Yeah. So, man, time flies. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Mm. Well, it's been awesome. I'm super glad I was able to get you on the podcast. Yeah, no problem, yeah. Not only for the show, but for personal reasons, because I've been a fan of your channel for a long time, and I was excited (laughs) about talking with you. (laughs) It's it's been fun, yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me. I had a blast. (laughs) 